Okay, so my name is Erik Rosén. I am working as a product area owner of the vision area at uh, Sensat. And I'll just uh, talk a little bit about computer vision, um, some basics and some applications of it. And maybe I'll do a deep dive in some uh, future meetup. In the automotive industry, we see a, a trend with more and more cameras equipped on vehicles and that the cameras are routed to a central computer. And at Sensac, we're using this to process the video streams in order to build a world model of, of what is happening around the car. We want to see lane lines and uh, objects and pedestrians and traffic signs and so on, which enables us to safely build self-driving cars, as well as collision avoidance features like autonomous braking for example, uh, children. And I mean, if you enable the car to, to see what's around you through computer vision, there is basically no limit to what you can do automatically. So vision is a real enabler for everything surrounding self-driving cars or other uh, support functions for drivers, which makes it uh, very fascinating to work with. Now, let's go into what it means. What is it that we need to do in order to uh, extract this world model from video streams? Uh, we can start by considering human vision. If I show an image like this, we immediately see it's an image of a car driving on a road with some uh, trees in the background. This is really easy for us to understand. We, we cannot even unthink it. We, it's just immediate. It's kind of... Yeah, happening immediately in our brains. But for a computer to do to realize the same thing, how can we actually program that? Uh, in order to answer that question, we need to look into a little bit what is an image. So a camera consists of optics, the lens, and it uh, projects light onto an imager. The imager consists of an array of pixels and each pixel measures the light intensity that falls upon it when uh, the camera shutter is open. So every pixel represents the amount of light that it captures with a number, typically between one and 256, but the, there are variations of course to that. So this is basically a matrix of numbers describing the image. It's common to divide this in three channels, red, green, and blue. And each uh, channel then uh, has, is represented by a matrix of numbers. Typical imagers has between one and 10 million pixels. This means that these matrices are typically of that size too. And computer vision is really about extracting the information we need from these matrices. And if you have video cameras, as we have in automotive, you have a stream of, of uh, matrices. So that's the problem. Now, how do we do that? It turns out it's really, really hard for humans to program computers to extract information from images. While it's so obvious and easy for us to see what we see in an image, it's really hard for us to formulate that in algorithms. It seems like we don't really understand what's going on in our brains. We're unable to write that down in simple algorithms. How come? Well, consider this really simple example. To the left, you see a ball lying on the ground. And to the right, you see a ball bouncing in the air. Now, the only thing which is different in these two images is the location of the shadow. So in order to understand that the ball is in the air, we need to have some kind of understanding of physics and light and how uh, the light, when it hits an object, casts a shadow below it. And maybe you start to get the feeling for how, uh, how complicated it gets to express all these physical rules in algorithms. And it's also such that you cannot only look at parts of the image. You need to really look at the entire image in order to understand what it is. So you have 
quite a few things going on. And humans somehow, we learn implicitly the rules of physics when we're young, but we don't really understand. We're unable to formulate these rules. We just take them for granted. Now, in the early days of computer vision, people, uh, researchers and uh, engineers, they were hard coding the algorithms by doing what we call feature engineering, trying to write down the rules for how to interpret an image. Um, and then uh, since 2012, approximately, there was a revolution or a disruption in computer vision where it turns out that we can actually learn these algorithms using deep learning. I will not talk about what deep learning is, but I will just give one image of it. Basically, you set up a construct of functions of functions of functions of functions. And the more functions of functions you have, the more layers you say that you have in your algorithm. And what we do is that we just initialize the, the weights and parameters in these functions completely randomly. And then we show the, the network or this algorithm lots and lots of images, and we give it the, the ground truth, the right answer. So if we want to train an algorithm to say that this is an image of a car, we would show it thousands or even millions of images of cars and other things, and we tell it it's a car. And automatically, we are learning the weights of this uh, network. And it turns out that this works super great compared to feature extraction or feature engineering in most problems. But it does not really solve the entire problem. So at Sensec, what we do, we use a lot of deep learning, but we also do use a lot of the feature engineering and classical programming. And we're trying to combine these techniques in order to do the job for us. So it's a lot of uh, tensor uh, flow. Python programming, C++, and CUDA. Those are the languages we typically turn to. So I will round off this little expose into computer vision by showing some videos of uh, things we are developing at SANSACT that uh, we hope will enable self-driving cars in the not so far away future. Can you see the video streaming okay? Yes. Nice. So this is an, uh, a video from our uh, 3D object detection network. It's a deep, deep neural network. And it is actually not only detecting and classifying objects, it's also uh, estimating where in the world they, uh, the objects are. So in order to provide that ground truth, we use uh, LIDARs in the training. Yep. The other obvious thing you need to, to understand is where the lane lines are, such that you can do lateral control of a vehicle. And here we use more of a mix of deep learning and then uh, quite much uh, post-processing using C++ programming in order to uh, detect and represent lane lines in 3D. And you typically want to see lane lines like 100 meters away from the car to have robust navigate or control. There is a question, Eric, yes, um, from Shell Olo. So what are the most surprising uh, error that AI does when uh, interpreting the traffic? Hmm. I don't, I don't know. I think AI typically surprises me every time I use it. You, you kind of think that it will work in a certain way, and it hardly ever does. So I, I, I don't know. It's a non-answer, perhaps, but it's typically very surprising what you get. But when you train it properly, of course, and you use it to, in order, like we do now in our functions, then it is well behaved. But you need. You need to be data driven when you test these functions and you need to have a lot of data to test to test them. Um, maybe, yeah, actually, I would say one thing they are uh, deep learning is working really well. Sometimes I'm surprised that the network actually does a better job than the human annotators we use to train uh, annotate the training data. So. 
Another question is sure. uh, how many FPS can you handle in this example? Yeah, in this example here, it's running at approximately 10 frames per second. Uh, it's typical in automotive that you run your cameras in between 10 and 25 hertz. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a trade-off of how, um, how much processing power you want to spend per image contra how many images per second you want to run. So, yeah. And then uh, another one, are you using YOLO algorithm? Um, we don't have YOLO in our stack today, but we are not afraid of trying out uh, famous networks. Uh, Net, I would say the kind of the overall architecture and the data, those are the constants and the networks that which network you use for what is uh, kind of can change more frequently. Um, but we also do quite a lot of uh, customization of the nets in order for them to run as fast as possible on the particular hardware we're using. But not YOLO here. Thank you. Okay, I'll continue. Yes. Here is an example that I like a lot, and a lot of the deep learning engineers wants to work with this as well. It's called holistic path prediction, where you just feed in an image to the network, and you, when you train it, you just give it the odometer data from how the, uh, the human driver drove, and you just ask the network to predict how the driver was driving. So this network is actually predicting waypoints up to 150 meters away from the Eagle vehicle. And then I have a project or <laughs> the engineers have uh, projected the results into the image to visualize the, the network predictions. And it is fascinating how well this works. Yep. So this is taking it a little bit more end to end, kind of, not detecting the vehicles and lane lines and such, just asking the network to predict where to drive. And of course, implicitly, um, I strongly believe the network picks up lane lines and road edges and, and, uh, and vehicles, but that's kind of in the hidden in the layers. We also do segmentation, so semantic segmentation in order to understand the road and infrastructure. So here you see the free space, the drivable space, the uh, in orange to the left, you see barriers in red and the road edge in yellow. And for some reason to the right, we've used a different color scheme, but the, the intention is to show that the, this algorithm works really well also in darkness or in nighttime. Of course, we have the headlights on in this case. So it's really important not only to detect vehicles, but also to detect free space. It gives you robustness. So those were all neural network examples. Here is a pure classical computer vision example where we use visual odometry. So basically detecting features in the image as in the upper left. And then we compare features between several frames. And by that, we can actually triangulate points in the world and figure out how the camera is moving over time. And we can also reconstruct the world in 3D. So this is about as advanced as it gets in computer vision uh, when you're doing classical computer vision, and it's a uh, really cool technology. Was there a question? Yes. Um, a couple of questions. Sure. So I'm going to read it up for you. From a technology point of view, what hardware are you using? Is it NVIDIA Drive Platform, as you mentioned, CUDA? Do you expect to stick to using CUDA or have you considered more standards based programming models like C? Uh, uh, I mean... in, in particular, with code plays automotive solutions uh, maturing? Well, my take, we're using NVIDIA hardware, the um, Xavier SOC is the embedded uh, SOC that we deploy our 
uh, algorithms on. We're also using a lot of NVIDIA hardware to train our neural networks. Uh, we are using CUDA to do the GPU programming and uh, as long as we stay on NVIDIA platform, we, we will stick to CUDA. Then we are very happy with C++ for all CPU implementations. So no intention to leaving that. I don't know, Kalle or David, you can int int interrupt me if you, if you disagree. No, uh, I agree. I can't mention that I really think that the SYTL looks promising. I think it's much longer from uh, the core working group who has been driving a lot of it, but we haven't looked into that in detail. It's more from a personal perspective that I, I see that going a long line. But I mentioned before that the, the standard is getting more involved in safety critical development, but uh, nothing we have looked in from a company view. But I think SYCL looks very interesting mm -hmm. from a safety viewpoint with C++. And then a follow up on the same question. Are you not concerned with CUDA vendor lock in? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't want to get locked in, but uh, you also want to kind of exploit something. So it's a trade off, I guess, you need to be making. It's the same with the SOC that we deploy our algorithms on. So we can optimize the hardware at hand and get more out of it, but then it will cost us more if we want to go to another hardware at, at some point. You want to comment as well, David or Kalla, on the program programming languages? Oh, I think you captured it well. I think it also comes from, uh, uh, I mean, more of, more of a high level technical strategy where we are not privy or, or maybe cannot talk about here. But I guess everyone knows that it's a fast changing industry, so. Yeah. And also with deep learning, it uh, that is also kind of a disruption in many ways. All um, right. Yes. Or did you have something more to say? No other more. Mm -hmm. I think that I saw more questions. Yeah, there are some more. For example, uh, do you also use temporal information so you can track, for example, velocities of objects around? Yeah, I mean, in this example of visual odometry, it is utilizing temporal information. So that's how we're able to triangulate the world. Uh, but of course, that only works on static objects. It is difficult uh, with the moving objects. And maybe as you see to the upper right here, we actually use the detections of our um, object detection network to filter out all the feature points that fall on the dynamic objects, which makes the visual odometry more stable. Um, then going back to objects, the network that I showed results from that is operating frame by frame, but we are also using uh, tracking over several frames to associate uh, boxes to each other and try to figure out uh, how they move. In particular, you can figure out what is known as the time to impact using these kind of uh, analysis. So yes, we're utilizing temporal information, but we're also using a lot of other sensors at Sansec like LIDAR, radars and ultrasonics. And we, we are doing what is known as uh, low level fusion. So a lot of the temporal um, analysis goes into Kalman filters, which is also fusing information from different sensor modalities. Then another one, uh, um, Serkan is wondering if uh, does if uh, these models work at night. Well, uh, for for deep learning, it's typically so that if you have not trained them at night, they will not work at night. If you include training data, sufficient amounts of training data from night, they will work pretty well at night. And that goes for basically everything. Will they work when it's raining or will they work when it's low standing sun, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for the f visual odometry stuff, I actually don't have a really good answer. I suppose you will have, you might have de some degraded performance, but I actually don't know. I would need to come back with that. So with Zensac, do we, do we trade them at night as well? 
Yes, uh, we definitely do. Cool. Another one, are you using uh, binary algorithms or HOG-based algorithms for, for feature extraction and uh, descriptors? Um, that is not my expertise, so I couldn't really say which extractors we're using. All right. Um, do you only use supervised learning or is unsupervised used also? We are mainly using uh, supervised learning. Uh, then the holistic path algorithm that I showed, some would call that unsupervised, which in the, it is in a sense since no human was annotating the ground truth. But of course, we're using automatic generation of ground truth since it's learning how the humans were driving. Um, then we are also looking into self-supervision for uh, example for our monodepth algorithms. Thank you. This was the last one. Okay. Um, maybe, I don't know if I should continue. I have one or two more videos. Um, Maybe you can share one more since we're running out of time. Yeah, um, it's nice with a lot of questions, but I, I can yeah. share. Uh, let me see. I like this one a lot and it's also combining. So this will be my final example then, how we generate geometric free space. So we're using a mono, a mono depth, which is a neural network predicting the distance to each pixel in the image. From that, we're trying to calculate if the world is flat or not. And we use uh, we um, take those measurements into a measurement grid, which is uh, projected into the image here. Here is also a top view of that measurement grid, and then see, see, we're using visual odometry to know how the car is moving between frames. And from that, we can actually track the flatness of the world in an occupancy grid over time. So this is a nice example of how we're tying together classical techniques visual, with the visual odometry, uh, with deep learning techniques, monodepth, and then implementing that in an occupancy grid using uh, CUDA programming. So this is pretty high tech, I would say, and a very important function to build safe self-driving cars. Cool. Then uh, some more questions popped up as well. Are you using any data from the vehicle if so itself or just sensor data? Yeah, so back again to the holistic path exam example. Um, here we're using uh, the IMU data from, uh, actually not from the car here, but from a more advanced uh, re reference box. But still, it, you, you would find these sensors on the car as well. So you could just as well have used them. So based on how the car moved, we're using that uh, to train the network. And you can do other clever tricks as well. OK. Can you use behavior cloning for control breaking? Yeah. I mean, uh, you could take it one step further. Here we're using like uh, behavior cloning, uh, if you if I interpret the, the the word right. But in order just to predict the path, we're not taking it to the step where we actually predict the the lateral um, torques or what, what do you want to say, like the input to the steering wheel. We're not doing that because we like to have kind of a modularized approach and only use um, yeah for, for safety reasons basically thank so you if something, if something goes wrong it's nice to chop up the problem a little bit but of course you can get really nice results when you take things very much end to end perfect thank you eric okay thank you very much